What's up? Good morning. You guys doing good? Come on now. Say looking good, feeling good. Look at your neighbor and say, you looking good today. Yeah, for all you single people in the room, you're welcome for your opening line. Let me encourage you not to leave it there. Come up with something else, you know, like, girl, you look like the Easter Bunny. You've been hopping around in my head all day. You know, just something. All right, so. All right, man. God is good, amen? Yeah. Amen. Today is Easter, and uh, it's super pumped. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your life and being here this morning. Um, that word Easter kind of throws up a lot of different things nowadays. Um, yeah, you say Easter and you maybe think about like Easter baskets. Maybe you had a mom and a dad that hooked you up or grandparents that hooked you up with the Easter basket or, or who thinks of candy or uh, colorful eggs. Um, there's all kinds of different things. Um, there's the Easter bunny, you know. Uh, I think the Easter bunny is kind of whack, personally. Uh, a rabbit that lays eggs that have candy inside that we tell our kids to eat. That's, that's just... I don't know who came up with that, but they were doing drugs, I'll tell you that. So... Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, Easter at our house is a, is a, is a big deal. Um, one of the things my wife does every year is she buys the chocolate Easter uh, bunnies. Anybody get their kids some chocolate bunnies? My littlest one, is, she's about six. She, um, her eyes get like, I mean, giant, like saucers when she sees it. And then there's always a look of disappointment when she takes that first bite because she always thinks it's solid. <laughs> but it's never solid, right? It's like, oh, man, they got me, you know? So, um, but Easter's more than candy, right? I mean, Easter is more than candy and baskets and chocolate bunnies and, and all that. Easter is, the, is celebrating the greatest event in human history, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. It's not only the resurrection of Jesus because it was more than him just coming back to life. It was him dying and actually coming back to life himself, but then creating the ability to bring us back to life as well, right? And, and, it's, and it's wild, Right? It's wild to, to grab a hold of that truth and, and to really comprehend and really understand everything that has happened that day. I mean, think about it. I mean, it's, uh, Jesus goes and he is whipped, he is beaten, he has a crown of thorns put on his head. There's all this stuff that happens, and then he dies. And for us, we know the story, you know, most of us. So uh, we're like, we still got hope. But can I tell you that at the end of that Friday, and not a lot of people had hope. It felt very hopeless. And, and if you read the Bible, you'll, you'll see that um, the sky turns black, you know, and a storm rolls in that nobody saw coming. And the truth is, the greatest storm that ever hit the earth was the day that the Savior died. And for three days, everything was silent. But then Sunday showed up. And, and even on Sunday morning... The, it still felt kind of hopeless because nobody knew what was happening over at the graveyard. They were still at the house just waking up. But a couple ladies, the Bible say, wake up and they walk over and they grab some spices and they're going to go anoint the body of Jesus. And that's something they did back then. You would anoint the body for many days after it was, it was, it was deceased and before they actually fully buried it into a tomb. They had it on the kind of the outs, inside the tomb, but outside the actual burial hole and, um, they would go and, and they get there. When they get there, they find the tomb is open, which is kind of shocking because uh, they're just nervous. Like, what has happened? Has someone come out here and just, you know, defaced it or done something negatively? And so they walk in, and it's pretty cool because they walk in, and this is what the Bible says, Matthew 16, 5 and 6. It says, when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in white in a white robe sitting on the right side. And the women were shocked, right? They're surprised. And the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. And then here's one of the coolest lines in, in the whole Bible. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. He is risen from the dead. You know, Jesus gave his life on a Friday, but guess what? Now it's Sunday. And everything changed when that first Easter Sunday happened. Everything changes. And like I told you a minute ago, the reason this is so important is not because just that Jesus comes back to life. That's, that's good, but he was God. We, I mean, he is God. He was powerful before and after. The difference is that, be, is that because he gave his life and then came back to life, that now we can come back to life with him. 
And this is how the Bible puts it, Romans 6, 23. It says, for the wages of death is, is, I mean, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And you might be thinking, like, why do I need to come back to life? I'm already alive. No, no, no. I I want you to hear me. Like, listen, the Bible says the wages of, of sin is death. You know what that means? That we are literally walking around dead inside as soon as we sin. And guess what? Every single person in this room has come short of the glory of God, me included. Every single person in this room is imperfect. Like we have, we have allowed sin to come into our life at some point or another. And because of it, we are now dead and need somehow, someone, something to resurrect us and bring us back to life. And that is what Jesus did. And how did he do that? And why did he do that? Why did he do that is John 3.16, because he so loved you. And he so loved me and he so loved the world that he does what he gives his only son. He gives his life for us that if we just believe in him, then we get to go from death to life. Look at your neighbor and say, Easter is actually about you. For there to have been an Easter Sunday, there had to be a horrific Friday. And you can't understand Sunday, and you can't grab a hold of what Sunday is and the greatness of Easter unless you can really understand and see what happened on Friday. So everybody close your eyes for just a second. And I want you to picture the cross in front of you. I want you to picture Jesus on that cross in front of you, beaten, whipped. His body's broken, and now it's hanging on a cross. I want you to see him for just a moment. And you have to see the cross because history has done everything to the cross but ignore it. And that's the option the cross doesn't give you. You can't ignore it. You you can't ignore a piece of wood that hangs and suspends the greatest um, claim in, in history. A crucified carpenter that looks at you and me and says, I am the son of God. You can open your eyes. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to that Friday. That Friday that Jesus went to the cross and, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you three different pictures, word pictures, some scenes I'm gonna paint in your mind that the Bible gives us and my question that I want to answer, what I want you to figure out is can you find yourself, can, is there a reflection of you somewhere in the picture, in the characters that we see in these pictures? So the first picture we're going to look at is in Matthew 27. Before we jump in there, I'm going to tell you what's happening. Uh, This, again, is is after Jesus has been falsely accused. He's been arrested, right? He, um, his his face doesn't look as good as it did a minute ago because he's been beaten. They've ripped some of the beard off from from his face. Um, He's been whipped and beaten to the point where some would say he's unrecognizable and finally they take a crown of thorns and they, and, they, and they push it into his skull. And it is a gruesome scene, but a lot of times we like to turn away from that scene. Anybody ever watch The Passion of the Christ? Anybody have a hard time watching The Passion of the Christ? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to, to, to think of Jesus and see Jesus in that way, but can I encourage you not to always grimace and turn your face, but sometimes force your eyes open and your mind open and remember Jesus like that. I'm not telling you all the time, but I think it's important that sometimes we don't turn away and we do remember him like this because you can only begin to understand how much Jesus loves you when you begin to understand and see what he was willing to go through for you. There's a lot of things I say I love, like I love um, bagels and cream cheese. (laughs) But can I tell you, I will not get wounded. (laughs) To be honest, I sometimes won't even be inconvenienced enough to go get, get up and make myself a bagel and, a cream, and with some cream cheese, right? But for something I love, ooh, I'm willing to go far. I'm willing to sacrifice much. And here's Jesus, after enduring all of this punishment, the whipping, the beating, all that stuff, he is then told, right, to carry a cross. He, they, they get a cross and they place it on his back and they tell him, you will now carry this to the place where you'll be crucified. Now, I want you to imagine Jesus, broken, unrecognizable, bleeding, and now being forced to carry a cross. Can you see him 
Can you see the effort he's putting into trying to carry this cross and finish this mission? Bible says he's trying very, very hard to do this, but the truth is his body starts to fail him. And as much as he wants to and as much as he's trying, he begins to stumble and he begins to fall. And even as he does that, the soldiers are just screaming and yelling at him, pick it up. Pick it up, let's go. And he's trying. Can, can you see him? He's putting every, every effort he can into it. And then all of a sudden, Matthew 27, 32 happens. And it says this, along the way, they came across a man named Simon who was from Cyrene and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Jesus is having a hard time carrying the cross. He's doing everything he can to do what the soldiers are trying to get him to do. Uh, he's being forced to carry the cross, right? And all of a sudden, there's this, this guy named Simon, and he's just walking by. Who knows where he, maybe he's coming from the grocery store. Maybe he was walking, maybe he was two blocks over and he heard kind of the roar of the crowd. And he was like, I wonder what's going on. Anybody been curious? And then all of a sudden, you get God. Well, listen, Simon get got, got got, okay? So he's walking by and a soldier just kind of grabs him. He's like, you, get over here. And you can't refuse a soldier, especially a Roman soldier with a sword. And, and he's just like, what? And he's, they're like, listen, pick up that cross. You're now gonna carry this cross all the way up that hill. Simon does not want to do this. Y- y'all get that, right? Like he, he does not want to help Jesus, in any way, shape, or form. How do you know that, Pastor Michael? Let me read it to you again. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon who was from Cyrene, and the soldiers, what's that word right there? They forced him to carry Jesus' cross. So I want you to imagine this guy Simon now in his, you know, regular robe, nice robe, you know, and he is now carrying, literally touching the cross of Jesus. Not because he wants to, but because he's being forced to. Now let me ask you a question. Are you in this scene anywhere? Can you see yourself? Can you connect with this scene in any way? Can you see your reflection here? Because I would tell you that I think in a room this big with this many people, there's a good chance there are people in this room today that feel just like Simon did that day. Forced to the cross. Not there by like real choice, deep desire to be there. I mean, are, let me ask you this. Are you, are you here because of tradition, right? Are you here um, because you heard your parents over and over as you grew up, man? It's Sunday, and on Sunday, we go to, you know, you've heard it a hundred times, so it just becomes part of this. Is, you do it because that's what you've always done. Now, here's, here's the thing about, here's what's so common about anybody that's found in this picture here, um, they all have one thing in common. They, they all either are forced or they feel forced to be there. They're, they're not there by inner desire. They're there because of some sort of circumstance or something makes them feel like they, they're supposed to be. Now, out of all the pictures I'm going to give you today, I'm going to give you three of them. Here's what I want you to notice about this one. Simon is the closest to the cross. He, he's, he's literally touching the cross of Jesus. There's a very good chance that Jesus was bloodied and broken when he was carrying the cross. So guess what? Some of Jesus' blood, the very blood that heals you, that was shed for us, has transferred from the cross, from Jesus to the cross and from the cross onto Simon. But never in the Bible do we ever read about Simon's salvation, recognition of who Jesus is. We never read later on, like, man, Simon went home and he told his wife, today I carried the cross of our Savior. The one that changes everything and changes us from the inside out. The one that is hope and gives us life like that. I was there today. We, we, never, we never read about it. So close to the cross, but far from Jesus. See, that's what we learn in this picture. You can be close to the cross but still far from Jesus. You can can know all about God, but still not actually know him personally. That's the first picture. Let me give you another picture here. Matthew 27, verses 35 through 44. Here's a whole other scene. At this point, Jesus has been crucified. He's on the cross, 
but I want you to keep taking a kind of a step back and see a picture of the whole scene here. And here's what this, it tells us. It says, after they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fastened above Jesus' head announcing the charge against him. And it read, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. And then two thieves were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well, then, if you are the son of God, then save yourself and come down from the cross. And the leading priests and the teachers of religious law and the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't even save himself. So he is the king of Israel, is he? Well, let him come down from the cross right now, and then we will believe in him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And listen to verse 44. Even the thieves who were crucified with him mocked him in the same way. Can, can you see them? Can you see this scene and how crazy it is? You got the soldiers over here, you know, gambling for his clothes. You got the, the thieves. They're just as, I mean, they're, they're there and in the same situation Jesus is in. But yet, can you see them just yelling curses and, and, and saying junk to, to Jesus? And then you have this crowd, this wild crowd, people that are either walking by and stopping or, or heard the commotion and started following. But here they are and they're just yelling and, and mocking Jesus. Can you see everybody? And then here's the question, same question. Do you, do you see yourself anywhere in there? Maybe you see yourself with the soldiers, right? I want you to imagine they're right next to the cross. I mean, they're, they're right there at the foot of the cross. And, and what are they doing? They're playing games. They're, they're playing games. The Bible says they're throwing dice and they're gambling for Jesus' clothes. They're so close to the cross, but they're missing what's actually happening on it. They fail to recognize that what's happening on it is literally for them. And I think some of us here can relate to playing games at the cross sometimes. I think, I think some of us are so lost playing the games this world puts in front of us and throws at us that we actually forget that we were created for more. We compete with each other like the way the world wants us to compete for things when a thing will never satisfy you. And then we buy into the lie. You, you know what those soldiers thought? They thought that the most important and most valuable thing on that scene was Jesus' clothes. So close to the cross, but so missing it altogether. Can I tell you that the enemy has lied to you as well? That some of us have bought into the lie that that next thing is going to complete us, is going to fulfill us. Some of y'all look at me like I'm lying to you, like, you crazy. Well, really? I'm crazy? Remember that relationship you thought was going to fulfill you and satisfy you? The one you were willing to sell out some of your character and some of your standards for? Because some of us got into those, like, we actually got the girl, we got the guy, and then what happened? We were still left unsatisfied, Right? The value we thought we would feel and worth we would feel because someone said they loved us, all of a sudden dissipated because the one we need to love us and actually loves us is actually Jesus. He's the only one that will complete us. Remember that promotion? We think, we, we buy the lie. Man, if we just have that job, if we just have that title, if we just have this many friends, if we just get that thing, if I can have just that, if I could drive that, if I just had enough of this, if I, my family could look like this family, if my marriage can look like them, if I just had a husband, if I just had a wife, I'm not telling you that those things don't bring something into our lives, but the completeness and the fulfillment and the satisfaction that you're looking for is not going to come from those things. If I could just have enough money. Man, if any of those things were true, do you understand that Hollywood would be the greatest place in the world, but instead what you find is all these actors running around depressed and committing suicide all the time? Why? Because they get to the place where they're like, I don't, I, I don't know what else I can try to go for. Because none of those things ultimately satisfy. And what do we end up with? We end up finding ourselves like the soldiers playing games 
playing these games that life has given us, and we're close to the cross, and we're made for so much more, but if we miss what's happening at the cross, we actually miss it all. The soldiers weren't the only ones there. They were also the two thieves. Verse 44 says, even the thieves who were crucified with him mocked him in the same way. And, and there's a part of me that wants to be like, I mean, seriously? You, dude, these jokers, are, you're getting crucified too. What, what gives you the right to yell curses at somebody else? Anybody here do stuff that you feel like you could tell yourself? What gives me the right to tell somebody anything else, right? Now, here's the deal. I, I have no doubt in my mind that those guys are hurt. Both those guys are frustrated and absolutely very, very angry. But let me ask you this question. Who do you think they're angriest at? Themselves. Probably angry at the choices they've made. Angry at how they got themselves into this situation where all of a sudden here's the end of their lives and here's where they're at, hanging on a cross. And yet, even though they're so angry and they're so hurt and they're so frustrated, how do they respond? They respond by lashing out, right? They allow that, vac that volcano inside of them to erupt. And who do they lash out on? The very one that loves them. The only person on the scene that's actually there doing something for them. I know I can relate. Can anybody else relate to that? Where all of a sudden you're angry and you're upset and you're frustrated and a lot of times frustrated at ourselves and yet who gets the brunt of it? The people around us that, that love us, that care about us. And some of us turn that anger towards God. God, why is my life like this? God, why have you allowed this? And, and here they are yelling curses at God, angry with the one that loves them. But, you know, the truth is, I think there's some people in this room that feel just like them. Hurt, you've been carrying this guilt from something either that you did or something that happened to you or you think you allowed to happen to you or, but you're carrying this and you feel shame and you try to bury it, you try to push it down, but man, it just comes, just comes out. Let me ask you a real question here, and only you can answer this. Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of being angry? Aren't you tired of being, like, walking around wounded? Aren't you, let me, let me say this, aren't you tired of, of, of doing it alone? Feeling like you're alone because you're having to carry all that? Listen to me. Nobody loves you more than the one who came to actually free you from that guilt and shame. That's why he did what he did. He did it for you. To be able to cover that wound, to be able to take on your guilt, to take your shame. Deserve it. Did it just turn off? You ain't gonna get me, Satan, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so we have the soldiers playing games. At the cross, you got the, the two thieves yelling curses and letting their anger just kind of lash out. But then there's a whole nother group. There's the crowd, right? Now, the crowd's very different than the soldiers and the thieves. Want me to tell you what makes them different? Uh, the crowd is there by choice. You know? Not the, 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 the soldiers had to be there. That was their job. They woke up that morning. Nobody said, you know, today we're going to go crucify somebody. No, no. They just woke up and went to work. And their boss said, hey, you, you and you, let's go. We're going to go pick up this guy, Jesus, and these other guys and grab a hammer, grab some nails. Like, they were just working. They were being told where they had to be and what they had to do. When it comes to the thieves, like, they didn't have a choice. <laughs> they're going wherever the, where the soldiers took them. And they're going to do, they're going to get, they're going to do or get done to them whatever the soldiers wanted. But the crowd, the crowd had to choose to be there. It was made up of people that either followed them. Um, it was made up of people that were either accusing Jesus or people that were just walking by and they would just stop and then join the crowd. And the crowd is there by, by choice. And I want you to understand uh, the, the meaning of, of, of the cross and forgiveness. And for that, you have to understand what was happening there, what was happening with everyone there. They're looking at the cross. They're looking at, at Jesus. And, and this is what they're saying. They're saying things like this. Look at you now. Like if you're so, you're so powerful and you could save others, right? Why don't you save yourself? You know what they're doing? 
They're trying to use their practical mind for something incredible and spiritual that's happening in front of them. And what they're feeling is this. They're saying, you know what? I'm too educated to allow myself to believe that a God would actually come down and die like this. That doesn't make sense to me. And because it doesn't make sense to me in those terms, I'm not going to allow it to go from here anywhere near here. And that's what they do. They couldn't, they, their, their educated mind and their pride couldn't accept that God would come and die on a cross, especially not for them. And maybe you're here. Maybe you're, you, you've thought that before. You've thought, you know what, man, believing in Jesus, man, that's foolishness. How about this one? Believing in Jesus, man, that's for weak people. Like, I'm too strong to believe that. You, you, let me tell you, one, that's pride. That's what that is. And that's a lot like the crowd that day and the religious leaders, right, that we find in this picture. Deep inside, what they feel is that the cross is foolishness. This is what the Bible says about that. 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. I guess my question is, how do you look at the cross? Here's another verse for you, Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. See, the thing about these first two pictures that I've shown you, one of the things about them that makes them different than the third one is that we've all probably been in one of these two pictures at some point in our life. Truth is, we're probably like, man, I'm, I'm, yeah, I've been like the soldiers. Oh, you know what? I'm kind of like the crowd. You, oh, mm-hmm. I see myself in the team. Like we, some of us can put ourselves in every single one of these scenes. But I'm going to show you one last picture. And the difference between the last picture and the first two pictures is that in the first two pictures, people were there by chance. Like Simon and the crowd, most of them were just walking by. They just happened to be in the right area at the right time. The soldiers and the thieves, like they were forced to be there. But this third picture, you can't get into this third scene unless you choose to get into this third scene. It's in this picture that you can understand what Easter is really about. It's in this picture where you understand what grace and forgiveness and the meaning of the cross is all about. I mean, listen to this third, third picture here. It's in Luke, Luke 23, 39 through 41. It says this, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So this is one of the criminals talking. He says, so you're the Messiah, are you? Why don't you prove it by saving yourself and us while you're at it? Verse 40, but the other criminal protested, don't you even fear God when you've been sentenced to die? Verse 41, we deserve to die for the crimes, for our crimes, but this man has done nothing wrong. I'm gonna say it one more time. We deserve to die for our crimes, But this man has done nothing, right? He he hasn't done anything wrong. And did you see what just happened there? Did you see all of a sudden one of the thieves in a moment recognizes who Jesus really is? He goes from cursing and making fun of him and mocking Jesus to all of a sudden recognizing, hold on a second, there's something different here. Like in my mind, what I imagine is that he said, he asked the question, could this man really be who he says he is? In my mind, I could see him look over, uh, and, and, and while everyone is screaming and cursing at him, he looks over, and what he sees is not a face of anger, but a face of grace. Tears that are coming down his face with empathy. And then he hears Jesus say something wild. Jesus, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How is this man forgiving people even in the midst of this? How come when I look at his face, I see grace and somehow love for the very ones that are crucifying him? How come a moment ago when me and my buddy over here were fighting against them when they were trying to nail us into a cross, he seemed to invite the nails? Could he really be? And then he recognizes who he is. And he says this, he says, he's not, he, 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 he's not guilty. We're guilty. And what he's saying is this, he's saying, we're dirty, he, he's, he's clean. Like, we're, we're messed up, but he's, he's perfect. We, 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 he's not on the cross for his sins, 
he's on the cross for mine. And then he does the most mind-blowing thing I think I've ever heard. You were just cursing at the man. You were just mocking him. You were just, you, you were part of the crowd, of the group, of everybody there that was just land blasting this guy. And then he says, um, will you remember me when you go into your kingdom? Can I ask you a question? What kingdom? This guy's about to die. And if you got a kingdom, you got to have a king. That's how I know that he recognizes who Jesus is. He's like, oh, oh my gosh, this is, this is the one. This is, he is the king of kings. He has a kingdom. Would you, I know I was just, I know what I said a moment ago. But will you remember me when you go into your kingdom? And then the wildest thing in the world, Jesus replies, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus forgives him. This is the same guy that was in picture two a minute ago. The same guy that was so hurt and so angry that he's literally lashing out at the very one who loves him. Can I tell you something? God isn't concerned about where you were a minute ago or last week or last month or when you did that thing or when that thing happened to you. You know what he's concerned about? He's concerned about you right now. He's concerned about your heart right now. Right now and from then, from this point on. You may realize today, man, I find myself in pictures one or two, but can I tell you that you don't have to stay there? That's the good news of Easter, is that you can actually move from picture one and two and place yourself in picture three. I want you to think about this guy, right? Because the last person you would ever think you would find in picture three, the picture of redemption, is this guy that was just cursing and guilty and mocking Jesus. This guy hasn't done one good thing and won't be able to before he dies. Sometimes we think we find value. We see, we find value in things by what we think how we can use that thing. You know what I'm saying? I can give you a piece of paper and you might be like, this is garbage. I can give that piece of paper to an artist and they'd be like, ooh, this is a canvas. They were, I, can, I can give you a piece of paper with Benjamin Franklin's picture on it, and everybody in the room's like, I'm an artist now. It's my canvas. I love it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, does that make sense? All of a sudden, he, it, oh, man. The last person we would ever expect is this thief, and yet here he is. He's guilty. He can't do one thing good. He doesn't deserve help. He doesn't deserve grace. There's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting word. Everybody say deserve. deserve. What if God gave us all what we deserved? We're like, let's get out of here. <laughs> like, everybody go hide somewhere, <laughs> right? The great news is, is that he doesn't. Is that he knew very clearly and very, very well what we deserve. And he said, I'll take what they deserve. And why don't you give them what I deserve. See, see that's the, the picture of the gospel. That's Easter in a nutshell. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he were us, as if he lived our lives, so that he could treat you as if you lived his. And Jesus looks at you and he looks at me and we're dirty and we're broken and we're guilty and we're shameful and at the end of the day, the truth is we got nothing to offer him. Man, that sounds a lot like that thief, don't it? And yet he sees us just like that. We have no way of cleaning ourselves, no way of fixing ourselves. We don't even have a way to get to God at that point. And so what, what does God do? He comes to us. He makes a way to us. And Jesus looks at you and he looks at me and he says, you know what? Blood has to be spilled for you to be clean. Okay, spill mine. You, you're telling me somebody's got to be broken so that you can be fixed? And Jesus steps in the room and says, okay, go ahead. Here's my body. Go ahead, break me. You're telling me somebody's got to pay with their life for their sin and their shame and their guilt? And Jesus takes his broken body 
And he lays it on the cross and he says, okay, take, take my life, my life for theirs. This is how much God loves you. This is what Easter is all about. I'm going to bring this to a close. I'm going to wrap it up here. T today is Easter. You can come up, Angel. Today is Easter, and it's the day that we celebrate Jesus coming back to life. But it could be so much more. It could be the day that you come back to life. And that's a, I'm going to tell you, we're, we're going to celebrate Jesus coming back to the end of eternity. But can I tell you that all of heaven will celebrate when you come back to life? That's what the Bible says. I think it's time for some of us to get out of those first two pictures. Stop playing games. Stop being angry. Stop being shameful. Stop carrying our guilt. I mean, you might have just found yourself walking down the street and you walked in here. Someone grabbed you and brought you. Maybe you, you work at Publix and you got one of the many, many invites. And guess what? You Simon in this story. You just happen to be walking by and somebody brought you. And today you find yourself close to the cross. Don't miss that the cross was for you. Don't miss that you're actually not here by chance at all. It's a divine appointment set by the Lord. He wanted you to know that he loves you, and that he sees you, and that he's got a plan and purpose for your life. I'm going to close with a story. And um, you're, you're welcome to close your eyes or open your eyes. I like to close my eyes when I hear stories, because then I can imagine them. But, um, and you might have heard the story before, but I believe it illustrates really how much God loves us. There's a, I'll start the story. You close your eyes if you want so. There's a, uh, a football team, and um, they've been playing together for, for years now, probably let's just say four years. They're in high school. They've been playing for four years, and um, they've all been together. It's been kind of the same team. They even have had the same bus driver all those years, and the team wasn't real good at first, but over the years and over all their experiences, man, they've kind of grown together, and they've gotten better and better, and finally, uh, on this particular day, they just finished winning the championship uh, for their city, and, and it's, it's just, man, it was amazing. They all jump on the bus, and they start heading for home, and they're excited, man. Their parents are all waiting for them at the school, and they, they know when they pull into that par school parking lot, man, there's going to be a giant party. And they're driving home and they drive over this. There's just one real tall hill they got to go over before they get back to the school. And they drive over that tall hill and they're almost home. You can feel the excitement on the bus. The school's just a few blocks away at the bottom of this hill. Now, here's the deal. At the bottom of this hill, though, there's this um, sharp turn to the left. And as the bus is going down, uh, the bus starts to pick up speed and pick up speed and they could hear uh, some panic in the, in the driver. They see panic over there and finally he, he just starts saying, we got no brakes, we got no brakes, y'all. Everybody sit in, we got no brakes. And all the bus driver could think of is that sharp turn and he knows at this speed and with the bus picking up speed, there is no way he can make that turn without the bus rolling over and chain star killing everybody. So the bus driver makes a decision he, 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 he actually, he has to make a decision. He, at the bottom of that, of that hill, before that left-hand turn, he can actually continue to drive straight. You know, there's a house there, and there's a gate there, and there's a field there, and he could drive straight through the gate and straight into that field, and, and, and hopefully the bus will come to a spot, a stop somewhere in that field. So he's driving, he's going down, and, but as he approaches the gate, he looks, and there's a boy standing in front of the gate. And now he has to make a choice. It's the team on the bus or the boy. And he instantly chooses the team and he drives through the gate and the boy. And the bus finally comes to a stop. The police and the firemen and parents all rush over from the school when they hear what happened. Students are crying and hugging parents and parents are so thankful that their kids are okay. All of a sudden, one of the parents decides to try to find the bus driver to say thanks for saving their kids' lives. 
They can't find them. They look and they look, more parents join in. They look, they just can't find them. And finally they go over to one of the policemen and they ask him, have you, have you seen the bus driver? We're looking for the bus driver. And the policeman says, oh man, I'm sorry, ma'am. As soon as the bus came to a stop, he, he kind of went into shock. He's over there and the parent, one of the parents quickly says, I, man, that's understandable. I mean, with the whole, with the boy and him having, you know, hit the boy and the gate and, and all that, I mean, it, it makes sense. And the cop says, no, no, you don't understand. And she's like, no, no, we understand. No, no, you don't understand. You see, this is his house. That was his gate. And that was his son. That was his boy. See, guys, in this story, the, the bus driver represents God. You and me, we're, we're the team on the bus. And that boy that was sacrificed for that team, that was Jesus. And the God that loves you made a real choice when he said, I love you so much, I will give my son for you. And he sat there and he watched as they beat him and they whipped him and they took a crown of thorns, they stuck it on his head and then ultimately nailed him to a cross because he loves you so much and he, he doesn't love your goodness, he doesn't love your potential, he doesn't love what you've done that's good or even what you'll be able to do in the future. He just loves you and all your imperfections. And he sees past all the junk and the stuff you've done and the stuff that's happened to you. And he sees you, the one he created and the one he loves. Would everyone, would everyone bow your heads now and close your eyes? Jesus died in your place so that you can trade away your sin and your guilt and your shame for his life and his grace and his peace and his joy and his purpose. Whether it's for the first time or because you walked away, I wanna give you an opportunity to come home today. To, 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 to move from picture one and picture two and, and, and join picture three where there's redemption. So would you accept his love today? Would you accept his grace and his forgiveness? Would you, would you choose to make him Lord of your life today? If your answer is yes, and you wanna be a part of this prayer that I'm gonna pray in just a second, asking Jesus to do just that, then when I count to three, would you open your eyes and just look up at me? One, don't worry about anybody else. Two, three. If that's you, just open your eyes and look up at me. <laughs> if you have your eyes open looking at me, just stay looking at me for just a second. If you're here and right now you have the, the in your mind you're thinking, I don't deserve this, I, I've gone too far, I've done too much. Man, know that that is the lie. That is a lie. The enemy is lying to you right now. I'm gonna wait till next time. No, no, no. Don't wait till next time. God has a plan and purpose. You're not supposed to walk out of here the same. You're supposed to walk out of here with a fresh start. So if that's you, come on. Even right now, open your eyes. Look up at me. If you have your eyes open and you're looking at me, could you just kind of? I'm gonna scan the room. It's hard for me to see faces, so I don't know whose eyes are open, but I wanna know who I'm praying with. Would you just kinda of get my attention? You can put your hand down. I'll acknowledge you, but I see both you guys, yeah. Come on, Jesus, I see you in the back there. That's awesome. I see you up there, yep. Right there, yep. I see both you guys right here, yeah. I see you, girly. I see you guys, come on, Jesus. Yep, I see you. I see you upstairs, yeah. I see you in the back and right there and right there in the back. I see you right here in the front, yeah. Is there anybody else? I just wanna miss you, I'll just scan the room again. I 
see both of you guys, yeah. Awesome. Well, let's pray this prayer. Say, say this with me, if, if you mean that in your heart. Here's what the Bible says. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord, that he is who he says he is, then today is the day of salvation and grace for you. So if you raise your hand, would you, would you pray this prayer? Would you just repeat this after me? Say, Jesus, thank you for seeing me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for choosing to give your life for me. I recognize, just like the thief did, that you are the Savior, my Savior. God, I confess that I've messed up, that I'm a sinner, and I need and want your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins. And I also recognize that mercy is a gift, that your love and grace are because of your great love for me, not based on me and anything I've done, but everything you did on the cross. So today I turn to you, I give you my heart, I give you my life, I give you everything. Be Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you from this day forth. In Jesus' name, everybody said, everybody said, amen, amen. amen. I love you guys.